Welcome back to The 1% Show. If you're new here, tune in to hear me spin the yarns with authors, savants, and eccentric humans every week. I'm your Aussie host, Brandon Nangavo, and it's time to kick back and enjoy the show. Let's go. Do you find it difficult to find time to read? Well, I put together an online course that will teach you how to get twice as much value out of books by reading half as much. It will show you how to strategically select valuable books before you even invest time into reading them. This is something that speed reading courses don't teach you. It will show you whether you should be reading books, ebooks, or audiobooks. It will show you how to conquer your wandering mind, how to apply what you read so you can actually create real results, which is what reading is all about at the end of the day, and how to avoid wasting countless hours due to poor reading habits. It's a lifetime investment that will help you to extract more value from every single book you read from now on. To get started, head to EliteReaderAcademy.com. Again, that's EliteReaderAcademy.com. I'll see you there. So, to the listeners listening in, um, could you just give a brief introduction of who you are, uh, Massimo, and what it is that you do? Um, I'm an evolutionary biologist as well as a philosopher of science. Uh, currently, I'm the KD Irani Professor of Philosophy at the City College of New York, uh, but I've had a sort of a dual academic career in both biology and philosophy. Sure thing. Uh, Massimo, and just to let listeners know, we actually, we initiated the, the first call, and what was quite funny was um, because Massimo's, uh, he's quite the expert on uh, on stoicism and I presume you'd consider yourself a Stoic, right, Massimo? Well, at least a, a student and practitioner of Stoicism, yes. Yeah, yeah. so I, I'd consider myself something similar. And so it turns out we had a few issues uh, getting the first call going. And what was funny about it was uh, none of us had too many concerns about the situation having to reschedule <laughs> and end it not working. So I thought that was quite a funny moment considering we, we are both practitioners of Stoicism and it didn't really phase us, which is great, um, but we'll launch into more of the, the principles of Stoicism in this podcast. Uh, so I'm going to hit you up with some, some questions, Massimo. Um, so most of them are Stoicism related, although there are some sort of uh, general uh, philosophy questions. So, yeah, we'll see how we go. <clears throat> right. So, do you know much about uh, nihilism, Massimo? Uh, yes, a little bit. A little bit? Yeah. So, I've, I've, I've just got a few questions about that, um, considering you're, you're right into philosophy, even though Stoicism is your particular thing from what I've I've read. Um, now, the definition I'm using here of nihilism is that it's the rejection of all religious and moral principles in the belief that life is meaningless. So, I'm wondering, how does a stoic deal with the meaninglessness of life? Yeah, that's, a, that's an excellent question. Uh, first of all, I actually, going, I'm going to wager that there is... N- there is no real nihilist out there. There, there. there are people that actually say they're nihilists, but they don't really believe it. Um, because it's easy enough, well, maybe not easy, but it's certainly possible to reject one's religious beliefs. So, you know, plenty of people have uh, done it all the time. You know, I was, I was raised a Catholic, and then uh, when I was a teenager, I began questioning the whole thing and rejected it pretty quickly. And I've been a, you know, a psycho humanist and an atheist ever since. So rejecting religion is pretty easy. Rejecting moral principles, I think it's next to impossible. And, and you, know, you may reject some specific moral principles for sure. You can say, you know, this particular idea that, that uh, some people think it's, uh, it's moral, I think it's not, or, or, or the other way around. Um, but rejecting morality as a whole, I think, m- would make it pretty much impossible to, to have, actually have a functional society. Uh, and, I, and I say that not just as a philosopher, but also as a biologist. I, I think there's a good reasons to think that morality is, in a sense, an instinct for human beings. That is, we have a, a, a inherited a biological instinct to uh, consider certain things right and wrong. Uh, we can reflect on that instinct, that we can improve it, we can, you know, fine-tune it, uh, we can have discussions about exactly what uh, we mean by right and wrong. But but really, I can hardly imagine anybody who doesn't get upset, for instance, if something unfair is being done to them, 
or uh, unless you're a psychopath, uh, somebody not getting upset about, uh, you know, when, when he sees other people suffering or even animals suffering. Um, those things are part of the moral sphere. And when the nihilist says they don't really exist, they don't, they don't, you know, they, they don't believe it. I don't know what they mean by that. <laughs> I don't think they're actually serious about it. I don't think they really believe what they're saying. Mm. So you think so, they must find meaning in something then? Right. So I think that everybody, well, first of all, uh, morality is actually distinct thing from from finding meaning right so so mm-hmm. um one could even say look there is no such thing as a, a cosmic or universal meaning uh in life and in fact i i agree with that statement i don't think there is such thing as a universal meaning for human life but that doesn't deny uh the role of uh you know ethics in in human intercourse i mean you again you, ethics is, is simply a way to to deal with uh, you know functional functionality as a human being in a society to be you know pro social behavior is simply a matter of uh, dealing with other people in a way that makes the group um, or the society thrive so I think that ethics is actually distinct from the question of meaning now that said, I also do think that human beings cannot really thrive without meaning in their life. Uh, there's plenty of empirical evidence, actually, that backs that up, um, uh, you know, from modern psychology and cognitive science. And so there are two, actually, I don't think that that those who consider themselves nihilists are serious. I think they do have meaning in their lives, except that that meaning comes from uh, uh, local things. You know, it's it's it comes, uh, let's say, out of interactions with other people. It comes because they have friends, they have relationships, they have children, uh, they pursue their own goals. They are they are they act basically as agents in their own life, and so they make choices. All of that, the the combination of all of that, is what makes meaning uh, in life. It's it's what makes a life a human life meaningful. So yeah, I, I even though morality or ethics, I, I'm going to use the two words interchangeably, uh, and, and then we can maybe we can talk about why, but. Um, I think there's a distinction between morality or ethics on one hand and and finding meaning in life on the other hand. The two are related, but they're not the same thing. Um, and I certainly think that both of them are distinct from being religious. One can definitely be uh, non-religious and have meaning in their lives and also act morally. Uh, I simply don't believe that anybody truly uh, thinks that there is no meaning in their lives and that there is no morality. Mm. Okay, sure thing. And so, in regards to the Stoics, uh, what did they do to to realize or, or find meaning in their life? Yeah, so for the Stoics, uh, meaning in you know a meaningful life. Actually, they wouldn't use that term. They would use a uh, the, the word eudaimonic, uh, which is a Greek word eudaimonia. It's a it's a Greek word that often is translated as happiness uh, in English, but that actually doesn't that's rendered the meaning at all. Um, eudaimonia really means a flourishing life, a life that is worth living. Mm-hmm. Uh, Aristotle, who was not a Stoic, but and but but it was in the same ballpark, let's say, uh, so so to speak. Aristotle uh, said that the eudaimonic life is the kind of life that you look back at the end of it and uh, say, yeah, that was that was worth doing. That was that was a thing that was worth uh, engaging. Um, so the Stoics think about a meaningful life in terms of a life that is worth living. And the life that is worth living, according to the Stoics, is a life of moral integrity. That is, the most important thing that a human being can do, according to the Stoics, is to uh, try to be virtuous. Um, now, virtue for the Stoics means something very specific. Uh, and it certainly doesn't mean anything like the modern Christian version of it. You know, when, when you hear the word virtue today... People think about chastity and purity and things like that. Hmm. Um, that actually is a much later uh, meaning of the word. This was introduced by, uh, obviously, the Christian theologian during the Middle Ages, in particular, Thomas Aquinas, who actually was influenced by the Stoics, but he added these, these additional uh, meanings of you know, faith, uh, hope, and charity, and therefore also chastity and things like that. That's not what we're talking about. The Stoics thought that there are four fundamental virtues, and these are practical wisdom, courage, justice, and temperance. Practical wisdom is the ability to navigate complex situations, especially complex moral situations, in the best possible way. 
So we all live complicated lives. We all live lives with different demands. We, we all have roles in our lives that we do. And sometimes those roles that, you know, that we play, such as, you know, you can be a father and as well as a son, as well as a husband or a wife, and as, as well as a friend and a colleague and a coworker and so on and so forth. Um, all of those roles put demands on us. And the Stoics thought that one of the most important things in life is to be able to navigate those demands in the best possible way. Not in a perfect way, because there's no such thing as a perfect way, mm -hmm. since these demands are actually, you know, in, sometimes in contrast with each other. Sometimes you cannot be at the same time, a, a, you know, a good professional and a good family person or, or something like that. Uh, so sometimes you have to choose or you have to strike some kind of compromise between the two. Uh, that's where practical wisdom comes in. The second one is courage, uh, by which they meant not physical courage or not as much physical courage, but especially moral courage, the courage to do the right thing, the courage to stand up. Um, and be counted, so to speak. And this doesn't have to be a, a you know, heroic thing, you know, that the sort of like the, the, the life-changing kind of thing. It can simply be, um, you know, standing up to your boss when he mistreats a coworker or something like that. Uh, you know, it's it's something as simple as that. So that's courage. That's moral courage. And then the third one is justice. Justice for the Stoics means treating other people uh, as human beings. Uh, not ju not just exploiting them for your own benefit, not just you know treating them as if they were things or or, or, or unthinking, unreflective beings. They are human beings, and so they they deserve uh, the kind of treatment that you would want uh, them to 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 deliver to you. So, um, in that sense, to be just means to be fair to, to other people in in your dealings with them. And then finally, temperance. Temperance is basically the ability to uh, strike a, the right balance between things. So, you know, one part of temperance is self-control. You, you don't do things in excess or in defect. You do things in a way that it seems to be proportionate uh, to whatever it is um, that the problem is. So you can, you can apply temperance in all areas of life. Um, uh, one of the uh, commentators on the, on the ancient Stoics, a guy named Diogenes Laertius, who wrote um, a, a book called The Lives of the Eminent Philosophers. Um, about the Stoics, he said that Stoics drink wine, but they don't get drunk. Uh, that, that's an example of temperance, right? So, mm. so you, you enjoy your pleasures, uh, but you don't do it to excess. You basically, you, you, you want to own the pleasure. You don't want to be owned by the pleasure. Mm. Okay, sure thing. Now, uh, in regards to religion, what, were the, what was the religious stance of the Stoics? Oh, that's an excellent question. Uh, so there is actually quite a bit of controversy about that, even in modern in, in modern scholarships uh, scholarship about the ancient Stoics. Um, I think that basically the ancient Stoics were pantheists. Okay. Uh, that is, they, you know, they thought that the universe, that God is the universe. God is the same thing as nature, mm -hmm. uh, and therefore God is literally everywhere. In fact, we are literally bits and pieces of God. Mm. Um, so that's an interesting vision. That's an interesting view of things. Uh, they also realized, however, that uh, that their ethics, which was the most important part of their philosophy, that is, you know, the ethics has to do with how to deal with other people in society. Uh, that that uh, whatever you believe religiously, uh, whether you do believe in God or not, whether you think that the the universe is ordered uh, or is chaotic, whether it is, uh, you know, the result of uh, of a sort of a, some kind of intelligence. Uh, or in fact, it's kind of just atoms smashing around in the void. They they were very clear about this, particularly Marcus Aurelius, who was one of the most prominent Stoics. That that independently of what you think, how you think the universe works, you still have to be a decent human being. So it doesn't really matter what your religious beliefs are. It doesn't really matter what your metaphysical stance is on the big things. The fa the fact is, you still have to get up in the morning, as as Marcus put it, do the job of a human being. And that job is, uh, according to the Stoics, to apply reason to your life as well as to social life. Uh, and the reason for that, it's interesting. Um, the Stoics often said that we should live our life according to nature, you know, or living, living according to nature, or following nature. And... Uh, that doesn't mean that we should be going, you know, running naked into the forest and hugging trees. <laughs> uh, rather, that means that we should follow. We should take seriously human nature, and um, when when we when we uh, act in in society, and human nature for the Stoics is fundamentally 
made of two components. We are social beings. That is, we cannot really live or thrive without the in interactions with other human beings. And we're capable of reason. The fact that we're capable of reason, of course, doesn't mean we're always reasonable. In fact, most of the times we're not. Um, but uh, it does mean that we can do it. And so when you combine those two things, then for the Stoics, the major point of human life is to use reason in order to improve social living. That's that's what we're here for, essentially. Mm, okay. And so, again, coming back to uh, religion, I'm just interested in your story. Uh, so you mentioned that you left uh, Catholicism uh, after reading Bertrand Russell's essay, Why I'm Not a Christian. Uh, you mentioned this in your book. So uh, I'm yes. curious uh, about, you know, what insights you got from that book that led you to to change. Well, Bertrand Russell uh, simply confirmed what I, I started to believe, on, you know, to think on my own. I, uh, I was lucky enough to grow up in, in Italy uh, when you have to take uh, three years of philosophy in high school. Mm. And so that kind of, you know, that, that, that really helped sharpen my, my thinking about a number of things, uh, including religion. So I, I was at the point where I pretty much was thinking about uh, along the same lines as Russell without, of course, his sophistication and without knowing that he wrote a book about it. And then at some point, I think it was my teacher in philosophy who actually mentioned the existence of this book. I said, oh, I got to read this. Um, and so when I read it, Russell essentially confirmed uh, and sharpened my own thinking about it, which is that um, there is no particular reason or evidence to think that there is a God, certainly not a benevolent God out there. Uh, you know, there is a lot of crap in the world. The world is not a, uh, you know, it can be a beautiful place, but it can also be a really crappy place. Uh, and if God really seriously were omnipotent and, and, and benevolent and all that sort of stuff, then I think we would be living in a better world. Um, I realized later that this is called the argument from evil. Uh, which is a standard objection to Christian theology. And, of course, there, is, there are responses to that objection, but I don't find actually those responses particularly convincing. So uh, pretty early on I decided that, okay, so, so Christianity wasn't going to be my thing. Um, now, for a few years, I kind of stayed in the limbo. So essentially, I considered myself an atheist, but I didn't really have a positive philosophy. I mean, atheism is not a philosophy. It's just a yeah. negative metaphysical stance, right? It's just, it just says, I don't believe that there is enough evidence to, uh, uh, to think that there are, there, there are gods out there. That's it. <laughs> End of the story. It doesn't really imply anything positive. I mean, today, uh, atheist movement... Uh, is actually split between, you know, sort of politically and socially. There is there's a progressive uh, wing and there is a libertarian wing. There are very few um, conservatives who are atheists, at least in the United States. Um, but I, but really none of that follows from atheism. I mean, you can be an atheist and, and be a conservative, a libertarian, a, mm -hmm. a progressive, a, an anarchist. It doesn't really matter. I mean, atheism by itself doesn't tell you anything about uh, society or politics. So for a few years, that was okay. Uh, but then, you know, then I, then I matured a little bit and, and I figured, okay, I actually do need some kind of philosophical framework uh, to orient myself, to, 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 to make decisions in, in my life, to, to decide how to deal with people, you know, other than my upbringing. I mean, the most, the most one can argue that the most important uh, source of our morality is actually, you know, our early upbringing, our parents, our uh, caretakers, uh, the early influences in our life. But at some point, you know, things get to the point where you actually want something a little more sophisticated than, than simply say, well, mom said that, uh, or, or, or my dad would be upset if I did that. Um, so when I got to that point, I started looking around and, and you know, in a sense, sort of shopping around for a philosophy of life, if you will. Mm -hmm. And pretty soon I ended, I landed on secular humanism. Um, and that stayed with me for, you know, decades. Uh, I still consider, in a sense, myself a psycho-humanist. Um, psycho-humanism is an interesting philosophy that was articulated mostly throughout the 20th century by people like Paul Kurtz, for instance, who was a, a very influential uh, philosopher in the skeptic and humanist movement uh, mm -hmm. throughout the second part of the 20th century. And um, there are uh, there is such thing uh, as the Humanist Manifesto. Uh, actually, there are three versions of it, I think. That have been published throughout um, the 20th century. The Human Ma Humanist Manifesto is basically a sort of a list of humanist principles. Okay. Um, and if you read them, uh, you know, they sound reasonable enough. Uh, they're, they're essentially a secular version of, uh, 
you know, human rights, uh, a list of human rights, you know, things like, uh, you know, all people are, are deserve of, of equal rights and attention um, and opportunity and, um, you know, education is an important thing, you know, science is, is a good thing, you know, that, that sort of stuff. Hmm. The problem with that, and that's reasonable enough, and, and as I said, I, I identify with that uh, for a long time. But the problem with that is that this, it increasingly, especially when, once I moved academically from biology to philosophy, that happened about a decade ago, a little less than a decade ago, I, I switched fields. And, and once I moved from uh, biology, that is from a science, to philosophy, then I started being a little bit more... Um, demanding, shall we say, mm-hmm. of my philosophy of life. I mean, it's like, you know, uh, pretty soon second humanism started looking like a laundry list of things that I liked <laughs> or, or, you know, a laundry list of things that I agreed with, mm-hmm. which is fine. I mean, that's certainly that's certainly okay for, you know, for lots of people, Does it does work. Um, but it didn't seem to have a sort of a coherent framework. I mean, why those things as opposed to other things? Uh, why, why that particular list as opposed to, you know, a shorter one or a longer one or a slightly different one, that, that sort of stuff. Um, and so there is, that was the point where I started more seriously uh, looking into uh, some, you know, what kinds of philosophies of life were available. I even read a little bit about Buddhism. Uh, I read about sort of Eastern traditions, but that never particularly appealed to me. That that kind of language just was alien to my sort of Western, mm. uh, uh, you know, upbringing. And so that, that never really spoke to me. And so very, very quickly, I landed on something called virtue ethics. And virtue ethics is usually associated with Aristotle because he's the guy that developed um, you know, a major version of it uh, in a book called the Nicomachean Ethics. And um, Aristotle basically said, uh, he, he was the one that was talking about eudaimonia. He was, he was talking about the life worth living. And basically said, you know, a life worth living is a life where you exercise virtue. Um, and although he had different ideas about virtue from the Stoics, that, that was my introduction to the, to the whole concept. And I found out uh, pretty quickly that a large number of so-called Hellenistic philosophies, those are philosophies that developed during the Hellenistic time, which means between the time of the fall of, you know, the death of Alexander the Great and the rise of the, of the Roman Empire, so we're talking about the third century BCE through the you know like first or second century mm-hmm. of the modern era, and in that time there were lots of competing philosophies in the Western world. Uh, Aristotelians, of course, there were Platonists. Um, uh, Plato was a st- student of, of uh, Socrates, of course, so he was influenced by Socrates. Uh, there were Epicureans. There were uh, something called Cynics, who were really funny bunch. Uh, the, the word cynic today means somebody who just say, says no all the times, who's negative about all, everything. But at the time, actually, the, the original word meant dog-like, uh, and that's because the cynics were living in uh, the life of uh, a life that very much looked to some of their contemporaries uh, as the life of a, a wild dog, mm. because they did not own property, they didn't have a house, they were just begging in the streets, really. Uh, while at the same time philosophizing. So they were walking up to people and talking about the meaning of life. Um, but at the same time, they were sort of uh, not owning anything, not living you know, anywhere specifically. Uh, so there were the Cynics, and then there were also the Stoics. The Stoics were one of a number, a very large, a fairly large number of Hellenistic philosophies. So when I started uh, studying virtual ethics, the first stop was Aristotle, and then I um, studied some of the other philosophies, particularly the Epicureans. Um, and they all seemed very interesting, but none of them really clicked. They, they kind of seemed interesting at, at a uh, sort of an intellectual level, but not really the kind of thing to say, oh, yeah, now I read Epicurus and I'm going to become an Epicurean. <laughs> yeah. Uh, by the way, Epicurean, Epicureanism, too, is not really what um, most people think it is. I mean, it, it wasn't about sex, drugs, and rock and roll. Uh, it, it, it was about pleasure, yes, but in a very limited uh, sense of the word, it really was mostly about avoiding pain. Mm-hmm. For Epicurus, the most important thing in life was avoidance of pain, uh, both physical and especially uh, emotional pain. Um, at any rate, so I studied, you know, this, this happened over a period of a few years, and I studied a bunch of them, and I thought that I, it, I had this, I developed this clear sense that the answer to my question of what philosophy of life 
is it going to be good for me, was going to be in the ballpark of virtual ethics. And yet I had not found exactly where in that ballpark this, this, this answer was going to be. And then one day, out of the blue, on my uh, Twitter feed, I see this thing that, it's, that says, help us celebrate Stoic Week. Mm. And I said, what the hell is Stoic Week? And I said, why would anybody want to celebrate Stoic Week? Uh, so I looked into it because I was curious. I realized that, I, you know, I remember the Stoicism was one of the virtual ethical uh, philosophies. I said, oh, let me take a look at this thing. Turns out that Stoic Week is something that has been organized for a number of years by a group of philosophers uh, and cognitive behavioral therapists, of all things, uh, out of originally out of Exeter University in England, but now pretty much in several parts of the world. And so I looked at it and I, I signed up. And when you sign up for Stoic Week, basically you, you fill out a questionnaire about, you know, how, what do you think about life, the universe, and everything. Mm-hmm. Um, and then you download a manual that for a week will let you basically live like a Stoic. Uh, that means you're going to be reading some of the ancient Stoics uh, and in some commentaries. You're going to be doing some exercises, as exercises and meditations and things like that. Uh, and then you're going to try to behave like a Stoic or according to Stoic principles for a week. And then at the end of the week, you, you fill out another questionnaire on, on your experience and you're done. So I did that. And I thought that this was really interesting. This was this really clicked. Uh, it was like, whoa, hold, hold on a second. Marcus Aurelius, Epictetus, Seneca, th- these people really do speak to me. And so at the end of the week, I contacted the organizers and I said, hey, I, I want to do this thing for another couple of months. Uh, would you mind, you know, sort of directing me to additional resources and, you know, wh- wh- where can I find other stuff that it's going to be good for continuing uh, this experiment basically on myself, this philosophical experiment on myself. And I got uh, help. And uh, I, at the end of those cu- those couple of months, I said, hey, this is really working. It seems like it's actually making an impact in my life um, and for the better. And so I committed to another year of practice. And at the end of that year, I committed to one more, and now we're almost four years down the road, and I'm still doing it. Wow, fantastic. And so what does stoicism look like in your daily life? Uh, it's a series of practices, uh, and, um, which vary from, you know, different people choose different routines, uh, you know, whatever works for, for individuals. I mean, it's, it's not a religion, so there's not, it's not like you have to do, you know, prayers six times a day or whatever mm-hmm. it is uh, on a fixed schedule. You, you just do whatever seems to work for you. For me, I can tell you sort of the typical day uh, as a stoic practitioner. Um, I start the morning uh, with coffee, of course. That's not part of the practice, but uh, I just need the coffee. And, uh, and then I open up a... Um, a book from the ancient Stoics, from Seneca, Epictetus, Marcus, whatever, and I read a bit, uh, a little bit of it, uh, not not a lot, just a, just a paragraph or two, and I try to reflect on how that particular paragraph sort of uh, may apply to my to my life. This is nothing strange, of course. This is exactly the same thing that a Buddhist would do uh, with their scriptures, or or a Christian, or a, or a um, somebody who is in Judaism or Islam or anything like that, you know, any, any religion or philosophy of the world, you would do something like that. Yeah. So there's nothing strange about it. Um, then the next exercise, also in the morning, and that takes a few minutes, is to sort of try to think ahead to the day that is that is about to unfold and, and, and imagine, you know, be mindful about what sort of challenges you might encounter. So if you know that, you know, on your calendar, you're going to have a meeting about this or that, or you're going to be teaching a class or you're going to be, you know, doing whatever, then presumably some of those situations will be challenging. And mm-hmm. the idea is to sort of think ahead of time about what sort of challenges and how you would uh, you will react as a stoic practitioner to those challenges. So the whole thing takes a few minutes between the readings and the reflection and sort of the thinking ahead. And then you start your day. And um, during the day, the major practice uh, that I do uh, is what is called stoic mindfulness and uh, Stoic mindfulness is simply paying attention to the here and now, to, to what you're doing, you know, to try to focus as much as possible to what you're doing, uh, not dwelling uh, in, in, sort of in the past, not thinking about what, what has already happened to you because you can't change it anyway, mm-hmm. and not thinking much about the future because that's also outside of your 
control right now. And at any rate, for the Stoics, the best way to, to prepare for the future is actually to sort of seriously pay attention to the present. Um, you also pay attention to the present in a sort of in an ethical fashion. So to give you an example, what that means is that whatever you do during the day, there's always going to be, almost always going to be an ethical dimension to what you do. And, and, you, and you start learning to pay attention to it. Um, let me give you just one simple example. Uh, early on in my practice, I uh, got out of my apartment in Manhattan and you know, walked to the bank and, you know, to get some money. And then I got out of the bank, got out of the bank and I said, oh, crap. Uh, I had one of these mindfulness moment, moments. I realized that the bank that I was using at the time was actually fairly notorious for having been involved in sort of international operations that are ethically questionable. Mm -hmm. So I went back and you know, I turned right around. I went back to uh, inside. I talked to, I asked to talk to a manager and I said, you know, I'm sorry, but I need to close my account. And the manager said, you know, this is no problem. Um, uh, would you mind if I ask you why? And he said, you know, is there you know, anything problematic with our services? You know, is there anything that we can improve? And, and I said, no, actually your services are better than the bank that's going to be bringing my money next, at which point he looked at me like, a, you know, like I was a little bit of a Martian. Mm -hmm. And I said, you know, the problem is really with your corporate practices, and I understand you personally can't do anything about it, but, I, you know, after all, it is my money, and I don't want to be... Uh, I wanted to be used for, for things that I find uh, objectionable. So I, I took my money and I went to another bank. Now, that other bank is not perfect because it's not just a think it's a perfect bank. Mm -hmm. um, but it is, you know, ethically a little bit better. And it takes me a little bit more effort to get there because it's not, a, it's not quite that close by. Um, but that's okay. So that's what it means to be ethically mindful during the day. You know, almost whatever you do. Uh, you know, the food you buy, the, the, the way you interact with other people, both strangers and, and friends or colleagues, all of that has an ethical uh, dimension to it. So then the last thing that I do is at the end of the day, and that's probably the most important exercise. It also takes a few minutes because, you know, if you, if you listen to my explanation, you might think that this is very demanding and takes a lot of time. But in fact, the whole thing takes very uh, little, especially once you, you get the hang of it. And um, in the evening, before going to bed, I spend a few minutes uh, writing down my thoughts about the salient things that happen, important things that happen during, during the day. It's kind of the reverse of the morning meditation, if you will. And while I do that, I follow Seneca's advice. And Seneca says to ask yourself three questions. Uh, what did you do right? What did you do wrong? And what could you have done better? And the point of this exercise is to, of course, be mindful and to reflect about your own actions and, and, and learn from them. Uh, the first question, what did I do wrong? It's not a question of, uh, it's not a matter of sort of indulging in regret and beating yourself up and all that sort of stuff. In fact, Stoicism is a very forgiving and self-forgiving kind of uh, philosophy. The point is simply to learn from your experience. Hmm. Okay, you've done something bad, fine. Uh, you know, make a note of that um, and set it aside. You know, it, there's nothing, else, nothing you can do about it at this point. It's it's in the past. It's outside your control. But you can learn from it uh, so that, you know, you're, hopefully you're, you're going to be less likely to repeat that in the future. The second thing is, you know, what did I do right? And that's because it's, it's okay to give yourself a pat on the back and say, hey, I did something right today. Um, I, I made some improvement uh, in, in my life. And then the third thing is probably the most important one, which is, what could you have done better? Um, the reason you ask yourself that question is because lots of situations kind of repeat themselves or repeat themselves in a, in a very similar fashion so that you're going to experience similar things in the future. And the first time you experience something, you are unlikely to react well because, as I said, that the unprepared mind, it's, it's, it's more likely to make mistakes. Um, but once you've experienced something, then the next time around, and then the time after that, and then the time after that, uh, you're prepared. Because, again, you learn from your experience. You say, oh, wait a minute. So I could have done this. Mm -hmm. So next time, let me try to do this. Uh, and let me try to handle the situation better. So that's about the, the you know, in a, in a nutshell, that's my historic practice. Wow. Yeah, that, that's super valuable because when people first come to Stoicism, you know, at first, uh, I presume they generally think, you know, like, what, what the hell is Stoicism? And it, I guess it sounds kind of boring to most people, like, oh, no, Stoic philosophy. It's another philosophy class back in high school or something, kind of that vibe. <laughs> so the way right. you put it puts it into real uh, practical terms, and, and your book definitely uh, does deliver the goods. 
uh, in such a respect that it's it's sort of easy to take in. That, at least that's what I found. And so the same thing's happening here in this interview. So, uh, yeah, I appreciate your responses so far. And I hope the listeners listening in right now are, are benefiting. Um, so to dig in uh, a little bit more, I just want to rewind a little bit back to when you mentioned uh, Plato. So I've heard a lot of rave reviews about Plato, particularly his work, The Republic. So I'm just wondering whether... Uh, Plato had any influence on the Stoics and whether Platonism, if that's a thing, uh, differs from Stoicism? Uh, that's a good question. Um, so, uh, Plato, who, by the way, that was not his actual, his actual name. Um, uh, uh, Plato just means b- broad-shouldered, and that's because he was a wrestler, uh, mm-hmm. and so he had large shoulders. Uh, but, yeah, everybody calls him Plato, and so <laughs> okay. that's the- be uh, keeping uh, for it. So Plato, as I said before, was a student of Socrates, and in fact, he was a teacher of Aristotle. Um, so you can say that, in a sense, it, it did influence the Stoics, uh, not through his own personal philo- philosophy, because Plato developed a philosophy late in li- later in life that was very much um, sort of kind of myst- almost, almost mystically oriented, um, and that was actually quite different from the Stoic philosophy. Okay. But but the, the, he did influence the Stoics in the sense that Plato, of course, wrote a number of dialogues, philosophical dialogues, uh, many of, of which featured Socrates as a main character. Mm-hmm. And especially the early Platonic dialogues, the ones that he wrote earlier in his life, uh, scholars think that they are more likely or more closely represent Socratic thinking. Um, and then the, the later dialogues actually kind of diverge and, and, and develop and reflect the, the development of Plato's own philosophy. The Stoics thought of themselves as Socratic. That is, they, they were very strongly, very consciously influenced by Socrates. And, and of course, they learned their Socrates from Plato. Um, so in a sense, yes, Plato definitely influenced the, the, the Stoics. Uh, there are major differences, however, between Platonic philosophy and, uh, and Stoic philosophy. In fact, the Stoics had ongoing discussions and you know and disputes uh, with a number of other philosophical schools. That was the, the that was the normal thing to do at the time. Uh, and uh, most of their disagreements were with three of the other major schools at the time, and those were the Platonists, the Aristotelians, and the Epicureans. Mm. Um, so, so now in in a nutshell, in a, in, in, in few words, Plato. Uh, developed, as I said, a fairly mystical uh, philosophy. He thought that mathematics, uh, w- that, that, you can, that you could establish morality or ethics on mathematical grounds, on very rigorous logical grounds. He was very influenced by Pythagoras. Uh, he, was, he thought that you know, mathematicians and geometers had, 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 were the most rigorous thinkers of them all, and so that you could uh, do philo- do philosophy in the same way that you could uh, apply logic very rigorously, and and develop a, a, a self consistent you know coherent and coherent philosophy. Um, but the way in which he developed it was to um, uh, go in the direction of the existence of these uh, reality that we have only uh, partial access to. Uh, if he used the famous analogy of the cave. Uh, where he thought, where he said that um, uh, our lives is like that of prisoners inside a dark cave who are chained to the wall, and we think that the shadows that we see on the wall are the actual reality, um, but in fact, reality is outside. It's it's colorful and it's three dimensional, and we only see a pale reflection of it. Mm-hmm. Uh, th- the reality that he was talking about was what he called the, the world of ideas, and and uh, he thought that. Uh, human beings can only access that world very partially and, and very uh, imp- imperfectly. What he writes in the in the Republic, um, the Republic is probably his major his major work, and in there he imagines his ideal society, uh, which uh, is led by philosophers. And the reason he's led by philosophers is because the philosophers are the ones that are uh, most likely by by sort of their ability to think uh, logically and think. Uh, you know, very um, cogently, they are the ones that are more likely to understand the reality of the, the, the world of ideas and therefore to guide the rest of us inside the cave, basically. Um, that's a very uh, picturesque kind of uh, uh, philosophy. It's, it's, very, it's a very powerful image, the, the, uh, the allegory of the, 
of the cave has been used by everybody in literature, including Shakespeare, and and it's been very influential. Um, but it's very, it's also very esoteric. There is, you know, we don't have any reason to believe that there is a world of ideas out there, mm-hmm. um, of which the actual reality, the, the reality as we experience it, is a pale reflection. And so the Stoics sort of rejected that kind of mysticism. Um, but what they did have in common with Plato is the idea that we can use reason to um, arrive at a better life. But they differ from Plato in the sense that they didn't think that just philosophers, meaning professional philosophers, uh, would get there. Anybody can get there. Uh, in, for the Stoics, anybody can be a philosopher uh, if they just put their mind to it. Uh, you don't need to be particularly you know, uh, sort of trained by, by in, the, in, in, the, in the Platonic Academy or in the Aristotelian school or anything like that. What you need to do is to just sharpen your, your ability to think by talking to people who know, uh, who have made more progress than you. So you learn from other people, uh, you sharpen your thinking, and, and eventually you can arrive at better decisions in life. That's a major point of stoic practice. It's the idea that you want to sharpen your, your sense of judgment as much as possible. The Stoics had a particular word for this. They called it prohiresis. Prohiresis is a um, uh, Greek world, w- word that just means judgment uh, or the ability to arrive at good judgment, the ability of making good decisions. Right, And so a major uh, point of stoic practice is to improve our ability to make good decisions. Mm, fantastic yeah that answers one of my next questions so i i, I might skip that one thanks for that <laughs> um now in regards to uh, ethics and morality and how a stoic uh, deals with this uh you know uh, veganism is one thing that's been on the rise in the past three or four years and it, it naturally brings up a lot of questions uh philosophically about what's right and what's wrong and uh you do yep. make a brief m- mention of the um the the vegetarian argument and you say something along the lines of uh it is not at all easy to calculate just how many uh, animals suffer and die when you take up a vegetarian diet because a large scale cultivation of a plant species for human consumption radically alters the environment of the planet uh, depriving right. a number of wild animal species of a vital ecological space, which I thought was super interesting. Um, and I'd, I'd never thought of that before. And then uh, I, I did highlight that. I thought it was a really interesting point. So I, I posted that uh, on uh, my Instagram and then I got someone that uh, replied and uh, he said, which I thought was interesting too, was that that would be correct if two thirds of crop production wasn't consumed as animal feed. So he says, Farming animals uses a lot more plants than not. Now, I don't think that argument is perfectly sound, but, uh, you know, I figure what he's saying here is that, you know, if you're farming animals and uh, it uses more plants. Um, so I'm just wondering what your thoughts are on that. Do you think there's there's more to this argument or...? Well, it's it's a complex argument, but but the bottom line is uh, when I when I made that comment, uh, I simply wanted to point out that some of my vegetarian friends uh, sometimes are a little too quick in in thinking that their position is obviously right. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Right? Um, and I said, you know, as an ecologist, I mean, as I said, you know, my first career was in evolutionary <clears throat> biology and ecology. So as an ecologist, I can tell you, it's not quite that easy uh, to calculate the impact that large scale agriculture and absolutely your your uh, your instagram follower or friend um, has a point there that it's it, it depends on how you use the, the crops uh, you know it's it's true that a large amount of crops go into feeding animals and from an ecological perspective i can tell you that that's highly inefficient because every time you go up one level in the food chain uh, so to speak uh, you lose about 90% of the energy uh, so if you eat plants directly, you're using a lot of the energy that is in those plants. Mm-hmm. But if you eat, if you eat herbivores, so if you consume you know cows and things like that, um, then you actually already lost like 90% of that energy. And if you go one more le- level up, so if you consume carnivores, for instance, yeah, uh, and it's even worse because you lost another 90%. So so it's very inefficient to be a, a carnivore uh, in that sense. In that- um, all I wanted to point out, however, is that even even so, the calculations are actually complicated. There, there's a lot of uncertainty. You can't. You know, it's it's not quite uh, as easy to dismiss some of the criticism that are raised against the vegetarian position. But overall, I think that the vegetarians clearly have 
the upper hand from a moral perspective. Mm. I, I think that I don't think there is a more there is a there is a there is really a, a reasonable question there. Mm. Uh, if you're concerned about the environment and if you're concerned about animal suffering, then there is no question in my mind that the vegetarian position is better. The vegan position is a little bit more complicated because one could say <laughs> one could follow the same logic and say, well, then why be vegetarian? Just go vegan, and that solves even more problems from an environmental as well as a um, you know, animal treatment perspective. And that's true, except that vegan, uh, a vegan um, diet is actually fairly difficult for human beings to sustain uh, uh-huh. uh, health, in a healthy fashion. It's very difficult for children, for one thing. Mm-hmm. Uh, not, notice that I'm not saying impossible. It is possible. But you have to take supplements. Mm-hmm. And so that means that you know, now, now you open up a whole different thing. And well, where, how do we produce those supplements? Where do they come from? You know, what, what kind of chemicals are we using? That sort of stuff. <laughs> Mm-hmm. Um, and it's also, at any rate, a fairly difficult thing to do. It's not, it's not easy to be, to be a vegan. Uh, so if you want to be a vegan, great for you. Uh, but if, I cannot imagine that that will scale up at the level of you know, the entire planet yeah. uh, any, anytime soon. So then, the, not only that, but there actually is empirical evidence that if you're, just talking, if you're talking instead of uh, ethics, if you're talking health, right, which are different things, of course. But uh, if you're talking in terms of health, the data seems to be pretty clear that the uh, best diets uh, in terms of human health are the vegetarian, not the vegan, the vegetarian, and the so-called Mediterranean diet, which is basically a vegetarian diet uh, supplemented with mostly fish. Right. Uh, you know, we're produced mostly from fish. Um, those are the best diets in terms of human health, meaning that they are uh, the people that eat those kind of diets uh, suffer the fewer fewer heart attacks and cancers and things like that. Um, vegan diets are less healthy, and then the most unhealthy are diets that are heavy in red meat. Mm-hmm. So, so that to me pretty much settles the matter. Meaning that if you're going, if you could be, be considered about your health, the environment and animal treatments, then one thing you don't want to do is to be a carnivore. Mm-hmm. Uh, th- th- that's definitely <laughs> out of question. Sure. Right? So all of the other options are okay. I mean, you can be a pescatarian. For instance, I consider myself a pescatarian. I, eat, I do eat fish. Yep. Uh, you do want to be careful about how you do it uh, because, of course, there is a problem of overfishing. There is a problem of um, if you eat certain kinds of fish, they actually are polluted by, you know, accumulation of uh, chemicals in their, uh, in their yes. uh, meat, you know, that sort of stuff. But you can do it. There, there are apps. There is a wonderful app by, that is put out by the, I think it's the San Diego Aquarium that um, um, tells you all you need to do in terms of sort of having a, a healthy uh, sort of pescatarian diet, uh, healthy and environmentally friendly pescatarian diet. So, so you can do it. So I think you can be a pescatarian, you can be a vegetarian, you can be a vegan, um, and there are differences in terms of uh, how easy it is and, and their sort of ethical impact. But those diets are, in my mind, unquestionably better than uh, an actual omnivore uh, diet, you know, a diet that is, especially one that is in red meat. Now, as far as the Stoics are concerned, some of them we know were vegetarian. Uh, and they, they wrote about it. Seneca wrote about this. Uh, Musonius Rufus, who was the uh, student, uh, sorry, the teacher of Epictetus, wrote about this. Um, they thought that a vegetarian diet was more natural, more more wholesome, uh, and it was also easier uh, because it required you know less preparation. I mean, you think about it. This, we're talking about ancient Roman times where uh, if people ate meat that that was especially the patricians that could afford it. And that meat was coming from all over the world, and it would require a lot of preparation and things like that. And so, Musonius Rufus clearly says, you know, the best diet is is one made of stuff that you can acquire locally, you can cook easily, and you can digest, uh, you know, efficiently. And that doesn't mean to it doesn't have to be a poor diet. You can you can still do a lot of things uh, within that range. Uh, but basically, they advised. Uh, not not as not as much for ethical reasons, um, but for health reasons. Uh, so to live simply, eat, eat simply, eat, eat foods that are not overly, uh, you know, uh, complicated or that don't require an inordinate amount of time or money uh, to prepare and you know that sort of stuff. 
Yeah, sure thing. As a Stoic, it is hard to uh, ignore something like veganism when it it does uh, come into existence, especially when it raises these questions. And yeah, from what you said, it sounds like a you've really thought it through because yeah just from my standpoint i'm just one that's investigating it so i don't have a firm stance on it so that's that's part of the reason why i asked you especially as a stoic which uh, a practitioner of stoicism which i consider myself too so it's it's something that's difficult to ignore so yeah i'm glad to see you've you've thought through it and especially you know i i i just instantly think of the counter arguments that would come from vegans so when you mentioned you eat fish obviously to an animal moralist or a hardcore vegan they'd say no no you can't do that um but the fact that you mentioned uh in terms of health you know uh that you have to be careful of things like you know fish farming and what can go into the fish and therefore maybe cause some right some bad health stuff you you've mentioned that you know if you be weary about it you can't succeed with it like you know for example you could uh buy wild salmon as opposed to fish farmed salmon um so i'm okay. glad you've considered things such as that so you've clearly done some uh some thinking so that's good to see uh yeah, I'm not sure how far I want to go down that rabbit hole. I mean, I guess there's one thing uh, more I'll mention on it, because uh, I was just talking about this yesterday, and we got into some really interesting discussion. Um, and, yeah, I guess I'm just wondering what your general view is on uh, well, this is a scenario where, you know, a lot of vegans seem to believe that uh, sentient being animals are sentient beings and that animal lives are equal to human lives. Um but then if you're yeah. fa- faced with the choice of, let's say you had to murder one, you had to either murder the pig or a human baby, well, in Peter Singer's original book that sparked this animal moralist movement, uh, he argues that the pig has more sentience than a human baby because it's right. got a more developed uh, nervous system and things of that nature. So he argues that you should kill the pig. But then I said to my friend, I go, no, I call bullshit here. Because are you really, mm-hmm. from an animal moralist perspective, are you really going to shoot the pig as opposed to the human baby? I just don't believe it. I don't believe it. That's not really a strong argument from my viewpoint. But just thinking in terms of practically, if that situation came across, like, what would you do, Massimo? Um, feel free to answer how you wish. Would you would you shoot the pig or would you shoot the baby? I'm curious. Uh, I would shoot the pig. Um, and, Me too. <laughs> and, yeah, and here's, here's, here's the reason. Um, so I do think that vegans and vegetarians, for that matter, uh, do have a good point that sentience is important. Now, there's a whole issue here of how exactly you define sentience and all that sort of stuff and it's Uh it's complicated but um but let's say that by sentience we mean the ability of a living organism to have uh perceptions you know sophisticated perceptions including perceptions of pain uh and and pleasure and um and possibly even pursue its own goals okay so some level some degree of consciousness basically so that's what i mean by a sentient being um, I don't think bacteria are, are sentient. I don't think plants are sentient, although there are people who disagree, but I think they're just wrong. Sure. That is a, as a plant biologist, um, just because plants and bacteria react to environmental stimuli, they have to, otherwise they wouldn't survive. That doesn't mean that they're sentient. I think huh. that sentient requires a uh, sophisticated uh, nervous system. Interesting. From what we can tell. Mm-hmm. Which means, incidentally, that not all animals even are sentient. So there's there's a pretty good case to be made that, yeah. for instance, insects are not sentient. Yeah. Uh, right. So now, where exactly that line is, it's it's very fuzzy, and it, it is, and isn't it, it? it? Yeah, absolutely. And and so if anybody says, "Oh, I'm absolutely positive that this this particular species is sentient, and all this other one is not," I mean, they're bullshitting. Uh, <laughs> one can make yeah. One can make it guess guesses, and also sentience or consci- and, 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 and as well as consciousness come in degree, uh, very likely, uh, right? So, so if you have a dog or a cat, for instance, I think that they have some degree of sentience, uh, but it's certainly not as much as yours. Yeah. Uh, right. So they can feel pain very clearly. Yeah. Uh, they they seem to be purposefully going after certain things, certain goals, but those goals are very limited. And in, in both in variety and, and in sort of duration. Your goals, on the other hand, are very sophisticated. You can think ahead years of time, you know, when, when you, when you uh, 
start going to college, for instance, what you what you mean what it means there is that you're thinking literally decades ahead uh, in terms of what what your goals are and what you want to do with life and things like that. So so clearly, sentience comes in degrees, mm-hmm. and I'm pretty willing to bet, uh, based on current biological knowledge, that a significant lo- chunk of of animal life does not have sentience or has very low levels of sentience. As I said, in, especially especially insects. But when you come to animals that have large brains and sophisticated behaviors, and pigs definitely have both. Yes. Uh, then, then yes, I think that 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 uh, pigs are sentient, and killing or or injuring or making suffer a sentient animal, I think, is not a good thing. But because sentience comes in degrees, and because human beings have among the highest degrees, if not the highest degrees of sentience on planet Earth, then in my mind there is no no choice really. If if there is if we're in a situation like the one you're talking about, I will always save the human being uh, and not the animal. Now it's true that human infants are probably less sentient than adult pigs, yes. but that's the wrong comparison to make, right? Because because uh, infant human beings have the potential to become adult human beings. Exactly, Massimo. Thank you. That's what I was trying to right. say in my last argument, and you've put it in clear words. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> well, the pig is there and it's stuck there and it doesn't go anywhere. Exactly. That's the, the maximum <laughs> level of sentience is going have. Now, the thing becomes more complicated for, you know, which is actually one of the, the reasons that Peter Singer is so um, um, controversial. Things become more complicated when you're talking about human beings who are severely mentally retarded, like you know, uh, infant human infants that suffer from spina, bi- uh, spina bifida, which is a very severe, uh, you know, sort of mental retardation kind of thing. Mm-hmm. Uh, Peter there argues that it, it's it is ethical to either abort late late in uh, in the term or even to exercise euthanasia uh, on the on the just born baby because they're not going to ha- they're going to suffer they're going to not going to have a good future what's euthanasia um, is that putting the baby down so basically yeah it's it's just you know it, it's it's uh, killing them in a, yeah. in a humane fashion to avoid uh, to avoid suffering sure um now there i think that's that's obviously highly controversial i do think peter has a point there i don't know honestly what i would do um but he has a point because you do have to ask yourself you know why why is it that you want to bring into the world, a human being who is going to be long, you know, short-lived because most most infant with uh, spina bifida will die very soon anyway, and it's going to be painful, a painful experience. So why, why would you want to do that? I mean, that seems like, um, uh, you know, treating a human in an in, inhumane fashion. So, but I, I do agree that, that that area is controversial. But if we're talking about a, a healthy human baby who is very likely to, bring, to, to grow up in a healthy ad, human adult, versus a pig, I don't think there is much of a, of a choice there. <laughs> yeah. That said, wow. however, you know, one reasons I don't eat, uh, you know, pig products, I don't eat pork, I don't eat things like that, is precisely because pensions, uh, uh, sorry, uh, pigs are sentient. Uh, and uh, when they're raised, as, this, as they're often are raised, in awful conditions for all, yeah. for most of their lives, just for human consumption, I really do think that's immoral. I don't, I really don't think how anybody could defend that sort of stuff. Sure. So one of the reasons I'm a, I'm a pescatarian rather than you know, sort of omnivore, for instance, is precisely because, you know, if we're talking about wild caught fish, and again, not overfishing, you know, you have to be careful about environmental impact and so on and so forth, right? Yes. There's a lot of caveats. But if we're talking about, uh, you know, wild fish, well, wild fish is going to die anyway. <laughs> uh, and yeah. It's going to die of a pred- probably a predator uh, anyway. So whether that predator is me or somebody else, it doesn't, or, you know, another fish, it doesn't really make, make, make much of a difference. For most of its life, that fish will have lived a normal, natural life mm-hmm. uh, with the normal, natural pains that fish life entails. That's very different, in my mind, from raising an or- a living organism, especially, again, a sentient organism, for the, uh, for the exclusive pleasure uh, of a human being and making that organism suffer for most of their lives. You know, um, I, I have friends who actually say, oh, I'm, I don't eat red meat, but I eat, you know, because I'm almost a vegetarian, but I eat uh, chickens. Okay. That's even worse. Yeah. Because, you know, 
people rationalize that by saying, you know, chickens are not that smart. They're stupid. First of all, what intelligence got nothing to do with it, um, but but or at least little to do with it. But the thing is, the fact of the matter is that the worst treated animals in the animal industry are the chickens. Uh-huh. Okay, so they suffer. You know, millions and millions and millions of chickens suffer every day. Uh, because of the pleasure of human consumption. So I think that one can definitely do without them. And, and uh, it, it really is hard to defend that sort of practice from, a, from an ethical perspective. Mm. Wow, we've covered some uh, very valuable ground. It would be interesting to see the, the comments section because I'm always looking at the counter... The counter arguments just to improve my thinking, a bit like uh, I think you said the Stoics do, where we, you sit down at a table and you have a discussion, and this is That's what I see that uh, this is what it is. So it'll be really interesting to see if there's any counter arguments because I'm always trying to poke holes in uh, why I should go vegan, full on vegan, and why I shouldn't. And uh, so far, it's still remaining uh, at this level basically where you're at like i don't necessarily eat fish but if i had to or there was some special occasion sure i'd, I'd probably have some fish uh I, i'd be concerned about where it comes from um, mainly right. in terms of health benefits whether it's been fish farmed and that sort of thing but uh yeah i feel like we're on a, a very similar wavelength here so i'm willing to change personally if i can see something that makes more sense but right now it doesn't make sense to go the full blowing vegan yep. to the point where you're not even you know squashing a mosquito type thing <laughs> so uh yeah <laughs> there's another little there is another advice from the stoics that actually i think it's pertinent here uh yep. to this particular discussion but, but it applies actually more generally um and um you know the stoics refer to themselves re, they, they rarely talk to, uh they rarely refer to themselves as stoics they they use the word procopton and Prokopton just means the one who's making progress, right? Mm. And so the idea is that you're trying to get better, uh, but you're not perfect. You're not going to be a sage. You're not going to be an ideal uh, human being. And uh, Seneca actually does say, you know, uh, explicitly, I'm not, I don't aspire to perfection. I just aspire to be better than yesterday. Sure. And so I think that in these kind of discussions, you know, people too often sort of get on a soapbox and, and they start lecturing other people about what they should do and what not, mm-hmm. not, not do. Well, first of all, Begin with yourself. You know, think about what you want to do and why you're doing it, and then then start lecturing other people. And and second of all, you know, if other people are making progress, you know, maybe instead of being complete carnivores, they are pescatarian, or instead of being pescatarian, they are vegetarian. That's fine. That that's better than most people are doing anyway. Uh-huh. Uh huh. So you just give them, cut them some slack, and say, okay, if that's the best that they can do at this particular moment in their life, that's pretty good. Uh, you know, sort of encourage people rather than sort of dismiss them just because they don't do exactly the kind of thing you do. Yeah, for sure, for sure. Okay, so we've covered a lot of ground there, so we're just going to move on to a few more questions I have here. Uh, So this is a more general one, but I think it's important to bring up, and that is some people say that taking a course at university uh, in philosophy is worthless and that we should be paying more attention to subjects like science and technology. What's your view on this? Oh, I think they're profoundly mistaken. And I, and I, <laughs> and I, I can tell you that as somebody who has taught both courses in, ah. in philosophy. Uh, don't, don't get me wrong. Of course, we have to study the sciences. Of course, you have to study the, uh, you know, technology, whatever, depending on what you want to do and, what, uh, and, and uh, your general understanding of things. I mean, there, there's no question that science is an important thing. Uh, and more science literacy, more understanding of science is only going to improve society. But at the end of the day, you also want to, you know, uh, expand your horizons in terms of your way of thinking. You want to talk about ethics. You want to talk about beauty, for one thing, you know, aesthetics. You want to talk about metaphysics. You want to talk about the big questions. Why is that? Because we're human beings. We want to talk about the big questions. Our meaning in life doesn't just come out of the, fa- out of the fact that we have a, one more piece of technology. You know, I got an iPhone. Okay, great. Good for you. What are you going to do with it? <laughs> are you just going to play video games with it? Because if that's the case, then, you know, I can argue that that's not the best use of that marvelous piece of technology. You can, do, you can also play video games. But if that's most of what you're doing, I think you're wasting a lot of time. And, and the very question of how to use your time, for instance, right? So, so what are the best uses of your time? That's not a, a, a question that a science can, a course is going to tell you. 
you know, when I when I taught uh, ecology or or general biology or those questions didn't come up. It's, it's just not the kind of thing that you teach in a science class. Um, so where are you going to learn that kind of stuff? Where are you going to learn it from in the humanities? Obviously mm -hmm. philosophy in part, uh, but also literature, for instance. I mean, I uh, or in history, I would say I would say that a education is absolutely abysmal if it does not include uh, philosophy, history, and literature. Uh -huh. uh, because, because without those disciplines and, and arts, uh, all four of them, because without those disciplines, you're missing a huge chunk of, of the human experience. Yes. You, you're missing most of what human beings have been doing for the last several millennia. And that's hardly a complete education. Um, the other thing <laughs> you need to think about is that, you know, there is an unfortunate tendency, especially in the United States uh, uh, in the last several years, um, to think of education only in pragmatic sense, in a pragmatic sense, right? So, so oh, yeah, it's, it's about getting a job. Yep. Well, yes, it is, of course. Everybody wants a job. Now, even if you stay at the pragmatic level, I can tell you that actually philosophy majors find better jobs more easily and higher paying than most other kind of uh, degrees. And the reason for that is because, of course, philosophy teaches you uh, sort of what are called portable skills, skills that are applicable in a variety of situations, yeah. such as good writing, you know, good thinking, critical thinking, uh, uh, ability to talk about all sorts of things in, in, a, in a meaningful way, ability to interact with other people. So, so one can even, even just some pragmatic uh, basis. One can make an argument that actually a philosophy major is a pretty damn good major, <laughs> but that isn't, you know. But that isn't my main argument. My main argument is that uh, education is supposed to be about making you a better human being, not just finding your job. Mm. You, you certainly want to find a job, as I said. Absolutely, we all find, want to find jobs because without jobs, you know, it's, it's going to be hard to have a decent life. But once you have a job, right? Once you start earning something. Then what are you going to do with it? What, mm -hmm. How are you going to use your time? Mm -hmm. uh, how are you going to use your resources? Are you going to spend your money? Doing what exactly? Well, the answer to that quest, to those questions come from the humanities, not from the sciences. Mm. They, they come from reflection on the human experience. And you reflect on the human experience by reading Shakespeare, uh, for crying out loud, or by learning about history. You know, why is it that Napoleon fucked up um, in, in, in Europe and lost at Waterloo? Why, mm. why is it's not because you're going to become uh, a general of the French army one of these days, but it, it teaches you about hubris. It teaches you about making wrong decisions uh, for the wrong reasons. It, may, it teaches you about priorities that people got screwed and, uh, and, and screwed up and therefore they screw up, you know, that sort of stuff. Um, so, and when you study philosophy, you are in conversation of some of the best minds that humanity has produced over the last couple of millennia. I mean, that, that is what I call education. Mm, wow yeah some of that stuff i didn't even consider well i do resonate with most of it but i i love your mention of what i would call transferable skills you used a different word but we mean the same thing you know yeah. skills that you can transfer to other areas of your life uh you know one classic example is communication you develop your communication skills and and that I'm sure a part of philosophy, you know, in terms of writing critically, uh, it can transfer to other areas such as, you know, maybe when it comes to applying for a job, for example, you know, maybe you've learned a few things about argumentation and I guess maybe marketing yourself in a sense, but even the bigger picture side of things, uh, which you've mentioned, like, you know, why are you using that iPhone? I, I, it's such a big question. It stems from philosophy. So, you know, I, I just know from my own experience, I actually dropped out of university halfway through my degree. I was doing an IT. Now, I'm not saying IT degrees are just straight out bad, but for me... Right. Uh, based on philosophical thinking, you know, I knew that I questioned why, like, why am I doing this? And I actually made the leap to, to drop out. And for me, that was the best decision I had ever made. Now, I'm not swimming in money right now financially. Uh, we're getting there. We are getting there. We are making progress every day. Um, however, I'm 10 times happier than I would have been pursuing that that degree where I, I had no why, I had no drive, I had no reason for it. And, you know, we wouldn't right. be sitting here today doing, you know, I've done over 30 interviews now, built a massive social following, it's still growing and, and things are slowly coming into fruition the way uh, I want them to. And, you know, I, I've, I've found that stoicism has helped me. Uh, with, you know, stoicism has definitely helped me uh, in that way. 
Yeah, because it, it fosters this inquiring mind, that you, inquiring attitude you're talking about. That is, you know, uh, it's important to ask yourself why. I mean, Socrates famously said that the unexamined life is not worth living. Hmm. Now, uh, maybe that's that's stretching the point. I mean, there's plenty of, of worthy lives that people live uh, without necessarily sort of in, in, indulging in, in, big, in big questions. But he did have a point in terms of it, it does pay. To, to ask yourself, at least from time to time, you know, why, what am I doing and why am I doing it? And what could I do instead? Mm-hmm. Because, you know, too many people, uh, this is just both anecdotal evidence from people that I know and as well as statistics that sociologists uh, have been publishing over decades. Uh, too many people get to, you know, the famous midlife crisis, you know, in your 40s or 50s. And, and they ask themselves all of a sudden, well, well, I'm not happy. And yet I have... I have a house, I have children, I have this, I have that, I have, I have you know, two cars, whatever it is. They have everything that they thought would, would guarantee sort of happiness, and they're not happy. Mm. And then, well, the question is, well, why, why not? And one reasonable answer is, well, that's because you're not doing something that makes you happy. Yes. You know, you're not doing something that is meaningful to you. Your, your job is just a way to, to pay the bills and, and buy that, that second car or that second house or whatever it is. But then the question is, do you need a second car? Do you need a second house? Do you need this or that or the other? Um, there was a, a really interesting article recently in the New York Times uh, that, again, was based on some um, systematic research in uh, social psychology that showed an interesting thing. You know, most people think that, lots of people think that buying things will make them feel better, um, which, of, which of course is an attitude that is fed by our consumerist society. You know, lots of people want to sell you all sorts of stuff, mm-hmm. right? Um, well, this research actually compared uh, what happens when people spend their money, on the one hand, buying things, and on the other hand, buying time, meaning they spend their money uh, in a way that makes them save time so that they can spend more time doing the kind of stuff that they actually want to do, right? Yeah. And the answer, the, the, the results were very clear. People who spend money buying things are not happier. And people that sp- spend money buying themselves time, meaning that they can uh, devote themselves to do things that they really want to do, are happier. Mm-hmm. I mean, there's just, you know, there's just no, no it's not even close. Mm. Not even close. So, so what about the people that, you know, there are people that are completely ignorant. They sort of go through life buying things just simply because that's all they know. They, they just believe that buying new things and new cars is the way to go. But then you've actually got other people who are quite self-aware. Like I've got one friend, for example, who is, I guess, pursuing something um, he slash she isn't particularly fond of, but they, they know it. But they're not prepared to take the leap. And I don't know whether they do that out of fear or procrastination. But my best bet is it's fear. I think there are a lot of people that are scared to make these big decisions, yeah. even when they know that it's probably better for them. So I'm wondering, yeah. like, how can these people deal with that uh, from a stoic perspective? Well, the thing about stoicism in, in particular is that, you, you know, you cannot force it on people. It, they, they have to sort of start exploring it on their own. I mean, obviously, if they if somebody starts exploring Stoicism and asks me or anybody or somebody else who is practicing for help, then be very glad to, to provide it. But it's not like you can go to somebody and say, hey, you should be a Stoic. <laughs> yeah. Um, that, that does, it doesn't work that way, right? It, it's, um, it's the kind of thing that has to come from, from a, your own decision. And you have to come to that place in life where you say, you know, I'm dissatisfied here. Why am I dissatisfied? And you start asking for you know, looking for, for answers to that kind of question. Uh, so you're right. Some people go through their entire life without even getting to that point. And, you know, it's, that it's their life, so it's not, it's not mine. And uh, if they're happy that way, I don't think they are truly happy. But, you know, if they're content enough that way, fine. Mm-hmm. Uh, that, that's all right. But I do that. But again, that, that, that is a question of education, to some extent, and I'm not talking about necessarily formal education. I'm not talking about getting a college degree in IT or whatever it is. I'm talking about education in the in the prof- more profound sense of the term, in sort of sort of learning how to live your life. That's what the ancient Greeks and Romans uh, were concerned with. Uh, when when you went to school in ancient Greece or Rome, you didn't just learn geometry or music or, or mathematics or whatever it is. You learned how to live, and we kind of lost that. 
we don't we don't think of schooling in that in that fashion anymore. But I think we should, uh, and that is one of the things that stoicism teaches you uh, that it's it's never too late to start examining your life. It's never too late to say, hey, why am I doing this, and what could I be doing differently? Sure thing. So we're coming to an end now, uh, Mas- Massimo. It's, it's been a great conversation so yeah. far. So I've got a few more questions I want to squeeze in. Um, and these are, yeah, really big ones uh, for me that I'd, I'd love to hear. And I'm sure the, the audience will benefit and you'll benefit as well, I think. So there's this one here. So there's this saying that someone's got it worse than you. Uh, like maybe your brother got murdered yesterday. That's a, that's a pretty big thing. It's a pretty bad thing to happen. So when your yep. boss yells at you or the gas price goes up, then you shouldn't complain because your brother, uh, you know, it could have been murdered instead. Right. Um, and I see that in the Stoic literature to think of something, a more painful loss to put things in perspective and realize that little things such as a gas price going up isn't actually that bad. So I've deliberated over this and I feel like it's a lot easier said than done. Because you have to imagine a hypothetical scenario. And for me, just personally, I find it difficult to attach any sort of emotion to imagining this event of my brother being murdered or some horrific event. So, I'm just wondering, like, does this piece of wisdom uh, work for you? And did it work for the Stoics? I mean, I guess it did because they write about it. But for me, I, I just find that difficult to to utilize in my life. What, what are your thoughts? Um, I do think I, I, it does work for me, and I do think it's a very valuable um, uh, sort of example of, of Stoic wisdom. Um, but it can be done in different ways, and maybe different ways work for different people, right? So, so the, some of the Stoics, for instance, uh, engage in something that it's referred to as sort of the view from above. It's it's a meditation. It's a kind of meditation where you actually uh, visualize. Uh, yourself sitting in a room, and then you know, as if you were l- l- looked at uh, by by a camera behind your 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 head, mm. and then you start zooming out, right? Um, and so first you you float, your, the camera floats above your uh, above the room, and then outside of the building, and then looking at the city, and then good, looking at the entire continent, and then all the way back up, in, you know, as far as you you, you want to go, the solar system, the galaxy, etc. The idea of this kind of meditation, which um, I do on a, a, an occasional basis, is to remind you and you know, put things in perspective. Remind you the fact that your you know your place in the cosmos is it's, it's really small. Um, and when you do that, at least to me, what that does is sort of it it, it helps me a, a achieve a, a certain degree of peace with my daily pro- problems, because my daily problems, by comparison, they really become you know sort of negligible. Mm. Uh, now that doesn't mean, by the way, I, I hasten to say, it doesn't mean that the Stoics are sort of quietest and they just take whatever problem without doing anything about them. And if you have a problem that you can do something about it, do it. Um, that you know, the Stoicism is actually about action. Uh, this, there are three fundamental disciplines in in Stoicism. One, it's called the discipline of action. That is, it tells you how to do things. You know, what what you need to do in order to improve things, both in your life and in, and, and for other people. So it's not a question of sort of, you know, stay back and, you know, and just take it. It's a question of taking action, yes, but always with the perspective that your action may not succeed and, and that your problems are, and this is a, a different way of thinking about it, your problems are the problems that, that have been occur, occurring to lots of other people before. So whatever you experience, you know, you experience your, your, your boss yelling at you, well, join the crowd. Uh, you know, lots of people have had their bosses yelling at you. In fact, that's what bosses do on a regular basis, right? Um, uh, that's a minor thing or, or, or a big thing, like, you know, you lost somebody you loved. Uh, that's a fairly big thing. And, and of course, you're grieving and, of course, of course, you're sad about it. But also, at the same time, you want to remind yourself that everybody loses people that they love. Um, you know, you're not unique. It's not just you. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I think it, it helps to get out of this... Uh, sort of self-centered uh, position. I mean, the Buddhists do something very similar. A lot of Buddhist practice is about getting out of this self-centeredness that you think that you're the center of the universe or that the universe has, you know, something personal about it uh, with you. It's, it's not. It's just, you know, life, this is the way life is. And part of the Stoic practice is to develop this sense of equanimity about what happens to you. It's not that bad things don't happen to you, they don't matter. Of course they do matter. 
especially to you because they happen to you. Um, yeah. But it's 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 that you want to take them in stride. You want to take the good things uh, for for you know and enjoy them, but also remember that they're not going to last because everything is impermanent. Everything doesn't last. And at the same, you know, the other, the flip side of that coin is that also the bad things don't last. You know, your your pain, your your grief, your sadness, and all that, all of those also are not going to last. Just like your happiness, your your you know, uh, uh, being very uh, you know, sort of glad of something, that that will pass as well. Everything will pass, and that means that you need to be in the moment and absorb the the, the experience as it is. If it is a bad experience, fine. Uh, it, will, it, will, it will soon be over. And if it is a, a good experience, then enjoy it because that too will also soon be over. Right? Mm-hmm. Um, so, that, so that's the idea. Now, uh, you say you, you can't relate to it uh, sort of emotionally. Try a different kind of exercise. Try either, either, either the uh, view from above, that I, as I said before, or try running it down, is in a, writing down your thoughts in a, in a diary. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Or trying to think about, instead of an abstract situation, and about something that really happened to one of your friends or, one of your, or, or somebody you actually mm-hmm. know, somebody you care about. Mm, I was and, just going to mention that my own personal experience that I've already experienced, that that does actually provide some benefit for me, something that's already happened that is worse than what I'm currently going through. Yeah, that's right. That's another. That's yet another way to, to, mm. to do it. It's like, well, you know, if, if I've been through worse, so I can definitely take this one on. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That's right. You and know, yeah. whatever Stoicism is a very pragmatic kind of philosophy. Whatever works for you, the principles are are sort of obviously important, but in terms of practice, whatever whatever actually is helpful, you, you do it. Hmm. Yeah, and the biggest thing, like I, I don't, I'm not phased by the gas price going up or our call not working out last week, uh, not for the reason of, of uh, you know, imagining something worse that's happened, but actual you know, the fact that a lot of these things are inevitable, you know, they're, they're bound to happen. So for me, that's the number one thing that provides me solace when little little things go wrong. Uh, it's going to happen anyway. Like there's going to be those, those yep. struggles. <laughs> so yeah, I guess it's, whatever works, right? <laughs> so, so the idea there, of course, as you know, is this called the dichotomy of control is, is, the, is to separate in your mind what you, what's actually under your control and what it's not. And if something like, you know, increasing gra- gas prices, that's clearly not under your control. I mean, you can, you know, you can certainly write to a politician and, and ask them to not do that or whatever. But, you know, in practice, yeah, the, the gas prices are going to go up. That's right. And there's not much about it. And so as a result, if there is nothing you can do, if it's a bad thing, right, if it's a negative thing because it's going to impact your life ne- in a negative fashion, uh, okay, that's bad enough. Now, why would you want to make it worse by actually getting upset? Right, because the, the 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 feeling of being upset and the feeling of obsessing over it and all that—that's all you're doing. Mm. It's not in the price itself. You know, the, the thing is going up of, of its own accord, and it doesn't you know it doesn't really care about your reaction. Now, what you're doing by feeling miserable, indulging in sort of in, in, in getting getting upset or something like that, it, it's just making it worse. So you should say, okay, well, that's outside of my control. Therefore, it's nothing to me. Not it's nothing to me. That's those are that's that's of course Epictetus. Um, uh, phrase, the way in which Epictetus phrases it is, it is nothing to me. It's nothing to me. It doesn't mean you don't care. Of course you care. Because if you had to buy gas, you, you're going to care. Uh, it's nothing to me, meaning that there's no reason for me to be concerned about it because there is nothing that I can do about it. So I better, I better spend my energy, my time, and my emotional uh, drive into doing something else, something that I can actually affect. Hmm. Mm, sure thing. So, uh, yeah, uh, we, we might go slightly over time. Talk about this same. I just got one more question I want to squeeze in. And uh, I think it's really important. And the Stoics say to speak little and speak well. They say, let silence be your goal for the most part. Uh, say only what is necessary and be brief about it. So, my question is why? Because there's a lot of extroverted A-type personalities that get a thrill from talking, even if it's not necessary. And you look at women, like, they talk about everything for the hell of it. It's it's crazy. And not all women, but most women do. They just yeah, talk careful. about crap. <laughs> be careful there because you're going to get a lot of comments. Yeah, I know. I don't mind. I'm a controversial character. So, I- I'm asking it. Like, I- I'm curious. Like, why, why speak a little and well when people want to speak about everything that particular type of advice actually comes from uh, epictetus and something similar it's found also in marcus aurelius um i don't think that necessarily one needs 
to speak little. I think that the, the basic advice is to speak properly. Okay. Meaning, you know, not talking just for the hell of talking. Uh, first of all, because you're probably not as interested in it as you think you are. I'm not talking about you specifically. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> sure. We're not we're as interesting as, other, as we think we are, you know, so other people get annoyed. Uh, just like, you know, imagine if you were in the company of somebody who just kept blabbering on and on and on about something that you don't really care about. It's like, okay, when, when is this guy going to stop? So, uh, so part of the idea, the stoic idea is just, you know, essentially not to be obnoxious in so, when you're in social company. You know, just don't, don't overplay it. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, do your part, contribute to the conversation for sure, but don't overplay it because you're just going to annoy other people uh, mm-hmm. to begin with. Um, the other the other piece of advice that it's um, uh, also found in Epictetus in that in that context is try to steer the conversation toward things that are actually meaningful or interesting. Um, and that I sh- actually think it's an interesting piece of advice. I mean, that's that's not to say you know don't don't talk about things that are not of big import. I mean, you can talk about all sorts of things, but conversations are actually more rewarding when they are. In- about things that are important and and uh, or or relevant either to your life or sort of to society in general. Okay. So, um, if you talk about trivial things, and especially Epictetus says, ex- particularly don't gossip about other other people. Mm. And and the, the advice of not gossiping is because gossiping for the Stoics is essentially unethical. You're talking badly about somebody who cannot defend himself mm. uh, because he's not present, right? I mean that's the essence of a gossip. So why are you doing it? To feel to to, to so that you can feel yourself you know better uh, by comparison? Uh, what the hell? What's 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 wrong with you? Mm. What, why do you need to put other people down in order to to uh, feel better? Um, I think that that actually is valuable advice. So if so, if the general idea is look, a don't be obnoxious. B try to steer the conversation toward more meaningful, more interesting subject matters, and and especially don't gossip because that's just nasty behavior. Uh, I can I can easily get on board on that. Hmm. Okay, sure. I guess now that I reflect on it, I guess my sort of little deliberation there was, you know, when I was with my girlfriend for two and a half to three years, I would see how these these girls chat amongst themselves, and you know, often you know, it was just trivial matters that I wasn't interested in. I like going into the deep stuff like we are now, but I, I suppose I was quite critical because looking back, I mean, perhaps what they were saying to each other, whether they were talking about. I don't know, the new cake they were baking or just normal everyday stuff, maybe that's important to them. And so therefore, uh, maybe to them that is speaking well and it is speaking proper and it does do something for them. So maybe it's just my uh, my own judgment that's getting in the way there. Maybe. Sure. <laughs> one, of, one of the things that the Stoics do advise is to be very careful about judging other people. Mm-hmm. Uh, it just says several times that, you know, don't... don't don't say that somebody drinks too much. Just say that he drinks a certain amount. <laughs> yeah. Uh, because you, yeah. Don't, you, know, you, know, you don't know enough about him. You don't know why he drinks. You don't know if he can take it. You don't know what, what's his motivations, what's his background. You, know, you, you really don't have a lot of information often uh, to judge people. So just abstain. Just uh, try to re-describe things in a neutral fashion. Hmm. Uh, and, and if you re-describe things in a neutral, especially other people's behavior in a neutral fashion, that, that's going to help you not to arrive at judgments, not to say, oh, he's a jerk. Well, he's not a jerk. He's just somebody who is behaving in a certain way. And, and <laughs> yeah. you know, and we all, some, sometimes we all are, jer- are jerks. We're all, we're, sometimes we, we, we all drink too much or do things that we shouldn't be doing. So it's, it's also a way of sort of being a little bit more um, understanding of other people. And as I said, forgiving of other people, which essentially uh, comes around to, to, to them becoming also self-forgiving because when you are doing the same thing, you say, well, you know, here, here we go. I'm not perfect. And next time I'm going to try to, to do better. Um, but as you can see, I'm just as imperfect as, as many other people. Mm, sure. Okay, cool. To round off the corners, uh, before I let you go and give you an opportunity to share where we can find you on, on the internet, I just want to ask if you could put a, a message or a picture or anything on a billboard on a busy highway, uh, what would you put on the billboard? Oh, that's a good question. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, I would have to go with uh, the beginning of uh, Epictetus in Kyridion. I would put that phrase there. Some things are up to us, other things are not up to us. Mm. Uh, and of course, as you know, it goes on and explains which things are and which fall into each category. <laughs> but that's that's the dichotomy of control. <laughs> 
that we were talking about earlier. And I think that if more people really internalize uh, that dichotomy, the idea of a dichotomy of control, their lives would be so much better. <laughs> That's actually the perfect message to put on a highway in particular, because if you think about all the traffic jams there, if they read that exactly. and actually applied it in that situation, <laughs> their lives would be so much better. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there you go. Okay, awesome. So, uh, I want to give you an opportunity, Massimo, before I thank you for coming on, uh, and that is uh, to let uh, our listeners know uh, where we can find you and your work on the world of the internet. Uh, so, you can find me on Twitter at uh, mplucci, P-I-G-L-I-U-C-C-I, or uh, I have two blogs. Uh, one, it's called um, Blue, uh, <laughs> Plato Footnote. Dot org. Uh, that's a, a blog about general philosophy. And the other one is, is of course, uh, called just like my book, How to Be a Stoic, uh, .org in, that, in the case of the blog, uh, where I write about my journey into stoicism and, uh, and uh, hopefully try to be helpful to other people. Brilliant. So, listeners, all the links are in the descriptions to uh, Massimo's places that he just mentioned including his book so definitely check it out and yeah once again Massimo I just want to say a big thank you this has been a uh, just a, a blessing to have you here uh, on the show today it's been a pleasure thank you for having me <laughs> all right all the best with your day all right cool let me know when he comes out so that I, I'll spread the link through my social networks yeah definitely there is a long waiting list so do expect it to take yeah. a while but it will come out eventually no problem all right, have a good one. All right, you too. Bye. Head to brandonnankavell.com slash subscribe. This is also the best way to interact with me and keep up with what I'm doing. Again, head to brandonnankavell.com slash subscribe. As usual, thank you for listening, my friends. I release new episodes every week. Make sure you don't miss one by subscribing. It's super easy and means a lot to me. Go to iTunes, search for The 1% Show and click subscribe. Once again, I'm your host, Brandon Nankervell, and I'll see you in the next episode.